Thank you for tuning in to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. If you have not, be sure to check out our Patreon at patreon.com slash finish the fight, where we have some amazing merch and plenty of other things for you guys. If you're an athlete, you know the greatest motivator of all is the fear of letting your teammates down. After all, a team is only as good as its weakest link. So you owe it to those wearing the same jersey as you to be your best every time you step on the field. That's why there's no vape in team. When you vape, you can expose your lungs to toxic chemicals that can damage your lungs. If you're a step behind, the team's a step behind. Brought to you by The Real Cost and the FDA. Welcome back to Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. Where we produce and develop the highest quality gaming research in podcast form. I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I'm your host, Derek Baker. And today, we're taking it back to the Super Nintendo, to one of my favorite games on there. I know a lot of other people have voiced that opinion and fully agreed with me, of course, because that's the true consensus of the population. Um, But we are going to be talking about Mr. Donkey Kong himself in... Donkey Kong Country. Yeah, what a character, right? We've gone from this Donkey Kong arcade kind of weird platformer where he's the villain, and now we're playing as Donkey Kong. This is sort of the turn where we start to see Nintendo embrace certain characters over others and Mm -hmm. start to try to form a true identity within their characters and video games. And what's wild, especially in Donkey Kong, is an identity and lore, building in various family members, various reasons to why things are going on. And it was a game that I don't think anyone really expected to come out. And it became this crazy hit. Again, it's Nintendo and all their early IPs of characters, for the most part, have kind of continued on that longevity of life. And this is where we're seeing him for one of the first times on console, on the home console, and lighting up people's TVs. Yeah, and this was a really fun game. Another side-scroller, and we just covered a side-scroller that was very, very popular, obviously, very iconic in Super Mario Brothers. And now we have Donkey Kong Country, where yeah. it's just a little bit of a different style, a little twist on that platformer uh, style mm-hmm. of gaming. Donkey Kong Country is a 1994 platform game developed by Rare and published by Nintendo for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. It is a reboot of Nintendo's Donkey Kong franchise and follows the gorilla Donkey Kong and his nephew Diddy Kong as they set out to recover their stolen banana horde from King K. Rool and the Kremlins. In 40 side-scrolling levels, the player collects items, defeats enemies and bosses, and finds secrets. In the multiplayer modes, two players can work together cooperatively or race each other. After developing numerous Nintendo Entertainment System games in the 1980s, Rare, a British studio funded by Tim and Chris Stamper, purchased Silicon Graphics workstations to render 3D models. Nintendo sought a game to compete with Sega's Aladdin, released in 1993, and purchased a large minority stake in the company. Tasked with reviving the dormant Donkey Kong franchise, Rare assembled 12 developers to work on Donkey Kong Country over 18 months. Donkey Kong Country was inspired by the Super Mario series and was one of the first home console games to feature pre-rendered graphics, achieved through a compression technique that allowed Rare to convert 3D models into SNES sprites without losing detail. It was the first Donkey Kong game neither produced nor directed by creator Shigeru Miyamoto, though he contributed design ideas. Following its announcement at the Consumer Electronics Show in June 1994, Donkey Kong Country was highly anticipated and backed by a major marketing campaign that cost $16 million in the U.S. alone. It was released in November 1994 to acclaim and sold 9.3 million copies worldwide, making it the third best-selling SNES game. Critics hailed its visuals as groundbreaking and praised its gameplay replay value and music. The game won numerous accolades, and although some retrospective critics have called it overrated, it is frequently cited as one of the greatest video games of all time. It has been ported to numerous platforms, including Game Boy, handheld consoles, 
and digital distribution services. Donkey Kong Country was key in maintaining the SNES's popularity when players were moving to more advanced consoles, such as Sony's PlayStation. It also helped establish Rare as one of the video game industry's leading developers and reestablish Donkey Kong as a key Nintendo franchise. Rare developed two sequels for the SNES, Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Kong Quest for 19, in 1995, and Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble in 1996. After a hiatus, during which Rare was acquired by Nintendo competitor Microsoft, Retro Studios revived the series with Donkey Kong Country Returns in 2010 for the Wii and Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze in 2014 for the Wii U, which was later ported to the Switch. So we definitely see them sort of taking advantage, I think, of this platforming style and trying to Mm -hmm. get as many characters in as they can, maybe to appeal to different audiences. It's not 100% clear, but very popular for the SNES. Obviously, unpopular enough to make its way to the Wii and the Wii U in sort of a mm-hmm. reimagined format. And I think a fun platforming uh, idea that, I don't know, it just separated itself from different titles at the time. I think about our last episode, I think about Super Mario Brothers, and I think about just where people were envisioning platformers and so many of them were vertical. This is one that really went left to right and really had like a nice clear pattern and clear characters. And I think that that's why this game was so successful. Yeah. I mean, I think it was one of those ones where especially rare establishing themselves and bringing a quote unquote new character, rebooted character to a console market and using those kind of pre-renders makes it look crisp, makes it look next gen. It made it look and rival that of getting into some of these newer systems that started to come out. And we talked a little bit about it in the Super Mario episode, but sort of creating a lore within Nintendo without really recognizing it. You know, you had those reused uh, fire bars, basically, Legend of Zelda and Super Mario Brothers. And in this one, you have a character from a classic arcade game come back and make it in this weird platforming thing that they hadn't done before and just sort of reutilizing the IPs in ways that, Mm -hmm. you know, is similar to, I guess, other media franchises, but new for video gaming as a whole. Sure. So Rare evolved from the company Ultimate Play the Game by former arcade developers Tim and Chris Stamper. After multiple critically and commercially successful releases, including Jetpack, Attic Attack, Saber Wolf, and Night Lore, Ultimate Play the Game was one of the biggest UK-based video game development companies. The ZX Spectrum home computer, the platform the company usually developed games for, was only popular in the UK, and they believed that working on that platform would not be beneficial to the company's growth, as they considered it a dead end. Meanwhile, the company inspected an imported console from Japan, the Famicom, and believed that it would be an ideal future platform choice for the company as it was more sophisticated than the Spectrum. It had a worldwide market, and its cartridges had no load times. As a result, Rare was established in 1985. Its main goal was to reverse engineer the console and investigate the codes for Famicom's games to learn more about the console's programming. With successful results, the company decided to sell the Ultimate brand to U.S. Gold and cease game development for the ZX Spectrum in the following year. The Famicom's manufacturer, Nintendo, claimed that it was impossible to reverse engineer the console. Using the information from the Ultimate Play the Game team acquired from Rare, the team prepared several tech demos and showed them to the Nintendo executive, Minora Arakawa in Kyoto. Impressed with their efforts, Nintendo decided to grant the Ultimate Play the Game team an unlimited budget for them to work on games for the Famicom platform. After they returned to England, they set their headquarters in a manor farmhouse. Rare also set up another company known as Rare Inc. in Miami, Florida. Headed by Joel Hochberg, the American company was involved in maintaining Rare's operation in the U.S. and contacting major U.S. publishers. Hochberg was previously the vice president of American arcade manufacturer Centuri. The Famicom was eventually released in North America and Europe, 
under the name NES or the Nintendo Entertainment System as we know it. With the unlimited budget, Rare could work a large variety of different games. The first project Rare worked on was Slalom, a downhill skiing game. The company then worked with various gaming publishers that included Trade West, Acclaim Entertainment, Electronic Arts, Sega, Mindscape, and Game Tech to produce over 60 games for the NES and several additional Game Boy conversions. They helped in creating new and original intellectual properties, including RC Pro-Am, a racing game with vehicular combat elements, and Snake Rattle and Roll, an action platform game with Tim Stamper developing the game's graphics. Rare also developed Battletoads, a beat-em-up inspired by the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles franchise. The game became known for its extreme difficulty, and upon seeing success, publisher Trade West published multiple ports for the game and tasked Rare to develop sequels. Trade West also gave their own Double Dragon license to Rare, allowing them to develop a crossover game between the two franchises. Rare released three Battletoads games in 1993, including Battletoads and Double Dragon, the Ultimate Team, Battletoads in Ragnarok's World, and Battletoads in Battle Maniacs. The last Battletoads game from that era was released for the arcade in 1994. Several Battletoads games were all supported to some Sega systems like the Mega Drive and the Genesis. And Battletoads sort of became a meme on the internet, right? Call up your GameStop, see if they have Battletoads. It was a very popular prank joke for a long time. Battletoads I own, and it is insanely difficult for no reason and very frustrating. And I've not gotten very far in it, but I have it. So I just wanted to be a part of the meme. (laughs) And it made sense to kind of convert that over to an arcade machine, feed them quarters in, very much like the TMNT games. Oh, feed them in. Well, I'm really good at like TMNT 3, that one in particular. Um, But yeah, the arcade versions of these games, they always just made them a little bit more challenging. The hit boxes, I think, are a little inconsistent. Double Dragon is another great one, and they actually did a remaster for that, I believe, for the PlayStation 3, maybe, at some point. I can't remember 100%. Uh, yeah, they, they've, done, they've done a couple ports with it, um, especially for like PC ports, and I believe some Switch ports coming with it, or have already come, um, for some of the Double Dragon content, which is in Battletoads, which is really cool. But obviously, very, very good at the side-scrolling beat-em-up stuff, and Donkey Kong is a little bit of a change from those style of games, but you can see where the influences and being good at the side-scroller stuff influences this game. Mm -hmm. Rare worked on licensed properties such as A Nightmare on Elm Street and Hollywood Squares, and ports including Marble Madness, NARC, and Sid Meier's Pirates. The development of four of Rare's games were outsourced to Zippo Games, including Wizards and Warriors and the third installment of the Jetpack series, Solar Jetman, Hunt for the Golden Warship. Rare eventually acquired Zippo Games and renamed them to Rare Manchester. According to Pitchford, a Rare team member through the late 80s and early 90s, Rare just wanted to make as many games as they could in their window of opportunity. The huge library of games made large profits, but none became a critical success for the company while less creativity and innovation were shown in them. When the Super Nintendo Entertainment System was conceived, Rare was not yet ready for the change. Rare limited their releases to some Battletoads games and decided to invest their significant NES profit in purchasing expensive silicon graphics workstations to make three-dimensional models. This move made Rare the most technologically advanced developer in the UK and situated them high in the international market. Their priority also changed at that time, as the team decided to focus on quality instead of quantity. Rare, using the SGI systems, created a boxing game demo and presented it to Nintendo. As the SNES at that time could not render all of the SGI graphics at once, Rare used the SGI graphics to produce 3D models and graphics before pre-rendering these graphics onto the cartridge of the SNES system, a process known as advanced computer modeling. Their progress with the 3D graphics on the SGI systems impressed Nintendo, and in 1994, Nintendo bought a 25% stake in the company and gradually increased to 49%, making Rare a second-party developer for Nintendo. During this period, Rare started selling their games under the trademark name Rareware. 
the company was considered one of Nintendo's key developers and had enough recognition that Nintendo offered Rare the Nintendo catalog of characters to create a 3D CGI game. The Stampers asked for Donkey Kong. And the resulting game was Donkey Kong Country, which was developed by a total of 20 people and enjoyed an 18-month development cycle. Rare staff also visited Twycross Zoo, observing and videotaping real gorillas. The game was a critical success, with critics praising the game's highly advanced visuals and art style. Donkey Kong Country sold over 9 million copies worldwide, making it the third best-selling game in the SNES library. So obviously a huge leap made in kind of just kind of churning these games out at the start, getting as much under their belt and claiming those profits as they could, but also getting their name out there, which is a huge aspect of it. And then saying, okay, let's use those to jump into this 3D art realm. Let's get these workstations. Let's jump into it because this is the future, not just of possible gaming, but just of computer graphics as they are. And this, you know, allowed them the key to the city, the key to Nintendo City to like, hey, pick anything you want out of these character libraries and make it. And that's when you know, like as a developer that you've made it and you're going to continue to make it for a while. The rare sale to Microsoft was very shocking to me because they played such a, a big part, in my opinion, of the early Nintendo success. And I was disappointed to see some of these characters make their way, some of the original rare IPs make their way over to a different competitive video game developer. But I'm super happy for the things that they were able to develop for Nintendo, spanning especially, I think, between the SNES and the N64. And, you know, to be honest, up Mm -hmm. through the GameCube probably as well. Just those games were very, very classic. And even though sometimes they were using Nintendo characters and sometimes sort of coming up with their own, I felt like Rare was one of the more solid, dependable developers for Nintendo and could recognize their logo just from a very young age. Yeah, and especially, like you said, like kind of capping at the N64 and then bouncing between a couple other devs until we get the sale to Microsoft, which is still developing um, a few of their own platform games and a few of their own things, as well as bringing, like you said, the whole old library to like the arcade and allowing kind of this rare arcade that they have out there, um, as well as like Game Pass, other things yeah. that it's available on. Um, but doing what Nintendo doesn't and bringing their old library back to life <laughs> is, is kind of like another great thing that we do see with that is seeing updates to it uh, to a new console chain but one that also is like, hey, we do care about the old things. Let's update them and have a classic version of it. So you're still able to play that piece of software that you may not otherwise be able to play without using emulation or through other quote-unquote illegal means to get that software. Yeah, I, I almost feel in a way that the MCU has sort of borrowed from this idea. That it's like, hey, you remember that random guy that we had in one issue of... <laughs> amazing spider-man from 1970 we should bring him back as a main villain let's do that i feel like nintendo was doing that with video games in the 90s basically they're like Mm -hmm. hey remember we had this guy he's basically just one big gorilla who was you know essentially king kong like what's his story what's his backstory (laughs) we can make him really interesting who is the dk (laughs) Donkey Kong. Let's give him a tie. Let's dress him up a little bit. You know what? He is the leader of the bunch. And we know him well. He's finally back to kick some tail. Exactly. So let's jump into how do we get this magnificent gorilla onto the home screen? What did development look like? What did design and characters look like? How did they do it? So as we said, Donkey Kong Country took about 18 months to develop, with programming beginning around August of 1993 and it had an estimated development budget of about $1 million. Rare assembled a team of 12, and according to product manager Dan Ausen, 20 people worked on Donkey Kong Country throughout the development. Some sources, including character designer Steve Mails and head programmer Chris Sutherland, indicate that development began after Nintendo offered Rare its catalog of characters 
to create a game using the SGI technology. And the Stampers chose Donkey Kong. Conversely, lead designer and Steve Mail's brother, Greg Mail's, recalled that it was Nintendo that requested a Donkey Kong game. So we got a little mix-up in the old history books here. If you know, if you are Donkey Kong, let us know how you were chosen. <laughs> the first demo <laughs> was playable by November 1993. The staff made Donkey Kong Country a side-scrolling platformer because they had grown up playing Nintendo's Super Mario games and wanted to deliver their own modern take. At the time, Donkey Kong Country had the most man hours ever invested in a video game. 22 years. In 2019... Oh, they're going for it. We, you see it in there. In I've 29, seen the hammers. Oh, you know, you know the hammers. You know the bonks. You know those rhinos? Them spiders? With the shoes? Oh, damn, Daniel. <laughs> in 2019, <laughs> Greg Mails stated that the number of hours the team put into Donkey Kong Country would be impossible in the modern game industry. He noted that game development was more of a hobby at the time, as much of the Rare staff were young and, quote, just felt like we're being given an opportunity to make something pretty cool. And that's all we were trying to do. Though Nintendo is usually highly protective of its intellectual properties, it was relatively uninvolved in Donkey Kong Country, leaving most of the work to Rare. Tim Stamper and Greg Mails were the only Rare employees who had significant ties to Nintendo during the project. Donkey Kong Country was the first Donkey Kong game that we had said earlier was neither directed nor produced by franchise creator Shigeru Miyamoto, who was working on Super Mario World 2, Yoshi's Island, an immediate, beautiful game that needs to be played by everybody at the time. Miyamoto was still involved with the project and provided certain key pieces of input. So. What those were, we may never know with it, but obviously probably creative standpoints or like maybe just, hey, a thumbs up from like outside the window as they look down at their office and he's just on the street smiling at them, giving him a, a good thumbs up. Yeah, he's working on Yoshi's Island and Rare is working on a good video game. So, Ooh. hmm, bam. Actually, I've never played Super Mario World 2, so... Yoshi's Island is one of the greatest NES, SNES games out there, so. I think I only beat the first one. Similar, it's similar, right? It's very close. Not at all. It's his own thing. He plays Yoshi. Okay. Then, yeah. No, I've never played this. It's, it's, a, it's a masterpiece. Is it on Nintendo Switch? mm -mm. <laughs> You're not that passionate there. about this game. That's all that I've discovered. You're not Listen, that passionate I, about it. I sleep with the cartridge. That's how I know. I go, <laughs> thank you, Yoshi. Thank you for being cool. Well, uh, you should definitely talk to someone about that. <laughs> Let's talk about the level design. It was heavily influenced by Super Mario Brothers 3. A great improvement over Super Mario Brothers 2, by the way. Mm -hmm. Just a reference to the last episode. <laughs> Greg Mayles said he wanted to make a game that was easy to pick up but would flow seamlessly if a player practiced. As such, objects such as enemies, swinging ropes, and barrel cannons were placed so players could continually move through a level as if walking up steps. Levels were designed using post-it notes that the team pieced together. Greg Mayles noted that the post-it notes kept design fluid and made it easy to scrap mistakes. The team began designing levels by establishing a predominant feature, like the swinging ropes, before determining the uses of the feature. And as Greg said, it was kind of done by getting the framework in place first and then filling the gaps in later. Secret areas were added while designing levels on post-it notes inspired by Super Mario and the Indiana Jones films. The player character's attacks changed considerably during development. Greg Mayles said that the team wanted moves that would be iconic. Because he wanted the game to be fast, the attacks needed to suit fast gameplay. Choosing a satisfactory attack proved challenging. Greg recalled that the team considered at least six different attacks, such as a slide and a leapfrog attack. One attack, in which Donkey Kong smashed his fist on an enemy's head to leap, was cut because it interrupted game flow. Cutting moves became so common that whenever one was cut, Steve Mayles would play the Queen song, Another One Bites the Dust, on a CD. Rare finally settled on the roll, which Greg Mayles noted worked similarly to a bowling ball, 
and the ability to jump in midair while rolling was implemented because the developers found it was easy to accidentally fall off a ledge while rolling. Greg Mails found the change useful, so he incorporated it into the level design. And so in a lot of ways, this game is almost like a Mario-Sonic hybrid. It's not quite as fast as the Sonic the Hedgehog series, but it wants you to move, I think, a little bit quicker than the Super Mario Brothers did. Yeah, I think it's bringing into that modern gameplay idea as well of like being able to have like traps and leaps and barrels and different creatures you can work with to make your way through the level while also slowing down a little bit to find those secrets and like get like the Kong tokens and find secret lives or, or, or you know, different passes you can do. And, you know, like you said, kind of bringing those two elements together of these platforming aspects of both games and, and being the, the middle ground, the, you know, an animal, but Nintendo, Sonic's an animal, Mario is a Nintendo. It's a marriage <laughs> right there. It saved, it saved the console wars. <laughs> I do think that it definitely emphasizes a continuous flow more than the mm-hmm. Super Mario Brothers game did. Sure. Just a little bit less than Sonic the Hedgehog, which also had its own secrets and little places that you could figure out. Uh, Donkey Kong was definitely a game more of memorization, I would say. Mm -hmm. Now, simultaneous cooperative gameplay was planned, but scrapped due to time and hardware constraints. According to Greg Mails, having two players on a single screen was challenging, while split-screen multiplayer was unfeasible. Simultaneous multiplayer also conflicted with his vision of fast gameplay. Mills said that if he were to remake Donkey Kong Country, he would want to implement the simultaneous gameplay. The team planned to have Donkey Kong wear a hard hat in mine levels, but this was replaced by Squawks the Parrot due to palette limitations and animation problems. Can you so imagine the- a parrot being uh, less palette-inducing than a hard hat? I mean, it depends what your color palette is using. I mean, if you, if you like, especially those mine levels where you're not having potentially brighter yellows and, like, basically scrapping it to have the palette already used around it, in today's gaming sense, you would just go ahead and change the Pantone real quick and just add it into your game because you have unlimited <laughs> space. But when you're slapping it on a cartridge like this, yeah, like, it's, it's weird to think about that, that, like, this parrot that has, like, those blues, reds, and greens in there versus again maybe a potentially yellow hard hat or you know whatever you're going to yeah. use with it it's it's interesting to see that like you said like that has less of an issue and animation problems sitting on donkey kong versus having squawks the parrot with you yeah exactly so sutherland also had to cut many of k rules animations for the final boss fight to maintain a good frame rate to the chagrin of steve males Programmer Brendan Gunn said most of the scrapped concepts were minor and only regretted that Donkey Kong walked across lazy dotted lines instead of paths on the world map. Reviewing the game for release, Nintendo directed Rare to significantly reduce the difficulty to appeal to a broad audience. Nintendo thought the numerous secrets would provide sufficient challenge for hardcore gamers. Hashtag hardcore gamers. Hashtag. At this point, Miyamoto made some last-minute suggestions, such as Donkey Kong's hand slap move, that were incorporated into the game. Hey, we found it. Thumbs up and hand slap move. Two things that he did. Yeah, that's true. Uh, and actually, uh, here's the rumor about it, too. As he was giving a thumbs up, in his other hand, he had papers he was supposed to deliver, and they started flying away, and he was slapping them down on the ground to catch them. And they looked out the window and went, Okay. We'll put that in the game. And that's how Donkey Kong's hand slap made it in there. Yeah. We're uh, now developing Super Smash Brothers and <laughs> Miyamoto's just slapping down at the ground forever trying yeah. to hit all these papers. But he can't. And then, yeah, just, and it just sticks with them and it goes through it. You know, yeah. the more you know. I like this alternate lore. This is good. Should well, do an tr- entire episode on alternate <laughs> lore. Okay. Like uh, Mario's fireballs is because they had like a really gassy plumber try and mm. fix the Nintendo plumbing system. Listen, it makes sense. <laughs> and it makes sense that, you know, as they tried to, you know, 
implement some of these things, you know, Miyamoto's hand slaps as he goes to wave his papers, uh, they were very supportive of Nintendo's input because they were inexperienced. They didn't know how, how gorillas worked in this realm or what Miyamoto wanted, and you ship it to them. Yeah, and the obviously <laughs> Miyamoto is established at this point, and mm-hmm. he is very experienced and has a clear vision for home video gaming consoles. And so I think if any developer, even whether it be this game in the 90s or it be a video game developer today, if Miyamoto True. says, hey, have you thought about this thing? I think that he just, his voice carries a lot of weight um, ever exactly. since he really established himself with those early Nintendo titles. So probably a good thing i think that he helped a lot obviously with the success of those early nintendo franchises and mm-hmm. regardless of if they're developed outside of the company so let's talk obviously about the characters uh nintendo started with just donkey kong and sort of expanded this family and so bayless was in charge of redesigning donkey kong and wanted the design to be simplified and compact the features were enlarged to make them clearer, while his eyes were taken from Bayless's Battletoad designs. Steve Mails contributed his mouth, which formed the basis for the other character designs. The red tie was suggested by Miyamoto in a faxed illustration, as he wanted the character to have a distinctive article of clothing like Mario's hat. And just, you know, look fancy for a gorilla, right? Exactly. Donkey Kong originally had only three fingers per hand, but a fourth was added when Nintendo informed Rare that individuals with three fingers are commonly associated with the Yakuza in Japan. Hmm. To develop Donkey Kong's movements, Rare staff spent hours at the nearby Twycross Zoo watching and videotaping gorillas, but found their movements were unsuitable for a fast game and instead based the animations loosely on a horse's gallop. The idea of Donkey Kong having a companion came from Rare's search for a game mechanic akin to the Super Mario series power-up system. Greg Mayles said, We thought a second character could perform this function, look visually impressive, and give the player a feeling that they were not alone. Greg initially intended for the partner to be Donkey Kong Jr. and created Diddy Kong as a redesign of the character. And, of course, if people don't know, Donkey Kong Jr. was the arcade follow-up to the Donkey Kong arcade game. Mm -hmm. However, Nintendo considered the redesign too great a departure from the original and asked that Rare either rework it or present it as a new character. Males felt that the redesign suited the updated Donkey Kong universe, so chose to make it a new character. Naming the character was a challenge, and Males dropped his preferred Dinky Kong following copyright problems with Dinky Toys. Steve Males created the other new Kong characters using the Donkey Kong model as a base. For instance, he created Funky Kong by taking Donkey Kong's model and adding teeth, sunglasses, and a bandana. Greg Males and the team did not want to put too much thought into creating characters, simply just wanting a diverse cast. The animal companions, such as Rambi the Rhino, were an extension of Diddy Kong's function as a power-up. A number of animal companions were cut, such as an owl who provided tips, who was redesigned as Cranky Kong. Cranky, who Rare considered the Donkey Kong character from the arcade games, was intended to be a character who hearkened back to the old times. Cranky's dialogue was written by Greg Mills and Tim Stamper. His dry sarcasm came from Rare's British humor. Rare avoided mentioning that Cranky was the original Donkey Kong in the game and marketing materials, fearing that Nintendo would disapprove of the idea. So we see now that, you know, a life of chuck and barrels (laughs) gets you to be (laughs) just a cranky old man sitting on some bananas. I find it interesting that there was an owl that provided tips like Kapora Gabora from the Legend of Zelda series. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, kind of using that as like the idea of it. But I do like the, the shift of like just making a full Donkey Kong family instead of having like these outside characters. It's just all Kongs that are coming in to help with something, whether it's the tips from Cranky or, you know, doing like some of the, like the flying and surfing stuff of like a couple other characters that you have that go through it, like 
jumping into Funky Kong and a couple of the Kongs that come along in the series. Um, it's really neat that they just kind of kept that running along with it. I think that it's really interesting that they decided to actually age the Donkey Kong character. To say that, of, uh, you know, there's a Donkey Kong right now. It's like Black Panther. Like, this is the guy right now, but there's been the Black Panthers of old. There's been the old Donkey Kong. Now he's Cranky Kong. He's old. Mm -hmm. He's not Donkey Kong anymore. It almost feels more like they were building a mantle for Donkey Kong, which is yeah, grandiose in thought and obviously never fully formed, but a cool thought nonetheless. Yeah. Hey, it's Kaylee Cuoco for Priceline. Ready to go to your happy place for a happy price? Well, why didn't you say so? Just download the Priceline app right now and save up to 60% on hotels. So whether it's Cousin Kevin's Kazoo concert in Kansas City, go Kevin! Or Becky's Bachelorette Bash in Bermuda. You never have to miss a trip ever again. So download the Priceline app today. Your savings are waiting. Go to your happy place for a happy price. Go to your happy price, Priceline. Yeah. As the Donkey Kong franchise did not have much of an established universe, Nintendo gave Rare freedom to expand it. Rare initially considered using the Super Mario character Wario as the antagonist and developed a storyline in which he stole a time machine from Mario. But Nintendo instructed Rare to create original characters instead. King K. Rule and the Kremlings were originally created for Johnny Blastoff and the Kremling Armada, a canceled adventure game Rare planned for Macintosh computers. When development of Donkey Kong Country began, Steve Mills reworked the Kremlings for the Donkey Kong universe. The Kremlings were originally to use realistic weapons, such as guns, but this conflicted with the game's lighthearted tone. Greg Mills also wanted K. Rule and the Kremlings to seem incompetent, similar to the villainous cartoon characters Dick Dastardly and Muttley. I'm hereby changing my name to Johnny Blastoff. I mean, you pretty much have to. That's my new name. Hello, and I if, am your host, no Johnny Blastoff. <laughs> and if no one steals Johnny Blastoff and the Kremlin Armada for a band name, what are you doing? <laughs> Johnny Blastoff? I mean, seriously, though. I'm stealing it. It's mine. Band name, I called right. it. Sorry, Deal. listener. It's stamped. Sorry. <laughs> Official. <laughs> Donkey Kong Country was one of the first games for a mainstream home video game console to use pre-rendered 3D graphics a technique used in the earlier 1993 Finnish game Stardust for the Amiga. Rare developed a compression technique that allowed the team to incorporate more detail and animation for each sprite for a given memory footprint, which better preserves the pre-rendered graphics. Nintendo and Rare called the technique for creating the game's graphics the Advanced Computer Modeling, or ACM, and this pushed the SNES hardware to its limits and there was concern that it would be impossible to compress the SGI-rendered models, which used millions of colors into 15-color SNES sprites. A single SGI screen took up more memory than an entire 32-megabyte SNES cartridge. Yes, that is correct. 32 mm -hmm. whole megabytes. Greg Mills compared it to turning a million-piece jigsaw puzzle into a 1,000 or 100-piece one. He described transferring the backgrounds into the game as the bane of the project and spent thousands of hours trying to split the images into tiles to fit it in an SNES cartridge. The team's mentality was to attempt to compress SGI visuals and implement them even if it seemed impossible. The artist began by rendering the characters in non-uniform rational beast blinds, or NURBS, using Power Animator and adding textures. They would then create the animations and render them frame by frame before compressing them for use in the game. The ACM process was handled by a designated computer that had proprietary utilities similar to Deluxe Paint. Adapting to the cutting-edge SGI workstations was difficult, and Steve Mills said that they had a really steep learning curve. Three programmers used the machines using only a massive user guide that wasn't written from an artist's point of view. The internet did not exist at the time, so Rare essentially had to work from scratch. A single model took hours to render, so the team would leave the computers running overnight. 
Sometimes artists would shut down other artists' computers in the middle of the process so they could render their models. <laughs> the SGI machines required a massive air conditioning unit to prevent overheating while the team worked in the summer heat without relief. A rumor suggested that Rare was investigated by the Ministry of Defense for their amount of advanced workstations. Although Greg Mail said that this was false, Rare did receive complaints regarding the amount of power the SGI hardware used. The Rare farmhouse where the game was developed also frequently lost power to the puzzlement of the electricity board. Sutherland was responsible for implementing the graphics in-game and found having to reduce characters' frames of animation challenging. To showcase the graphic fidelity and immerse the player in the game, Rare chose not to include a heads-up display, with information such as the player's banana and life counts only appearing when relevant. The pre-rendered graphics allowed for a more realistic art style, so the team incorporated what would simply be floating platforms in the Super Mario games into the surrounding environment. For instance, platforms took on the appearances of trees and jungles or walkways and mines. Rare also attempted to keep the look of the levels consistent so completely different landscapes would not be right next to each other. Tim Stamper, who spoke with Nintendo of America every night, encouraged the team to go to the extremes in terms of visuals. Steve Mails recalled that Stamper told the team that he wanted the game to still look good two decades in the future, which, to be fair, it does. It does look pretty good. I think Gun most of the a- SNES games look pretty good. Yeah, for the well, N- Nintendo-specific ones, I would say, or like published by Nintendo. Yeah. some Most third-party ones are iffy at best yeah that's fair yeah gun added that in addition to stampers pushing the team was also under significant pressure to finish the game in time for thanksgiving due to nintendo's competition with sega a few weeks into development rare at the point when the team had established how the game would look presented a demo to nintendo in japan rare's audience included miyamoto game boy creator gumpai yoki and the future nintendo president Genyo Takeda. According to Greg Mails, Nintendo was impressed. Though Yoke said that he was concerned the game was too 3D to be playable. Mails attributed this to the shock Yoki felt by seeing such advanced graphics. Yes. Yeah, You've sus. never seen anything like this. That's <laughs> sus, man. Sorry, it's too 3D. There's no too way people 3D. you can't even comprehend. I've been playing Pong for 25 years. <laughs> it's popping out at me too hard. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think it is sort of interesting. If you've never gone back and played this game, I think that this is in the SNES uh, virtual console thing for the Switch. It's definitely worth so. going back and playing and just sort of seeing, like, there's almost this, like, shiny quality to the game it's just a little bit different Mm -hmm. it's obviously not the remaster it's not tropical freeze or anything like that but i think that this game best represents the graphical significance of the snes and so i can see why uh (laughs) mr goompei yokoi is very very uh flustered by these 3d advancements Nintendo of America chairman Howard Lincoln unveiled Donkey Kong Country at the Consumer Electronics Show in Chicago, which lasted from the 23rd to the 25th of June 1994. According to Bayless, Rare spent about a month preparing for the reveal. The unveiling showcased various gameplay sequences and did not reveal that Donkey Kong Country was an SNES game until the end of the presentation, fooling the audience into believing that it was supposed to be for Nintendo's then-upcoming Nintendo 64. Steve Mails considered the shock that the audience felt after learning it would release for the SNES the proudest moment in my game-making career. Donkey Kong Country was backed by an exceptionally large marketing campaign. And according to the Los Angeles Times, Nintendo spent $16 million on Donkey Kong Country marketing in America alone. At the time, significant game releases typically had a much smaller average marketing budget of maybe around $5 million. It was also one of the flagship titles of Nintendo's Play It Loud marketing campaign. 
Nintendo sent a promotional VHS tape, Donkey Kong Country Exposed, to subscribers of Nintendo Power magazine. Exposed, hosted by comedian Josh Wolf, provides a behind-the-scenes glimpse of the Treehouse, the Nintendo of America division where games are tested. Nintendo World reports Justin Berube wrote that Exposed was probably the first time most people outside of Nintendo learned about the Treehouse and allowed players to see a game in action at home before it was released. The path to learning about upcoming games was no longer confined to magazines. Exposed also features gameplay tips and interviews. It concludes with the segment reminding viewers that the game is available only on the 16-bit SNES, not on the rival 32-bit and CD-ROM-based consoles such as Sega's Mega CD and 32X that boasted superior processing power. Do you remember getting those VHS tapes from Nintendo Power? You get Pokemon? Um, I didn't get any of them. I never did Nintendo Power until way later. Uh, but I do remember them and the variations of like, you know, exposed and different gameplay elements and gameplay demos as a VHS, which is really interesting. I just remember it being really shocking when all of a sudden I get this random VHS in the mail and, you know, my dad's like, Hey, you got a tape. What is this about? (laughs) Is this like Tommy Lee? What's going on here? And, uh, I mean, obviously, no, I was way too young for that. But yeah, they they would send promotional stuff to the magazine subscribers through VHS Mm -hmm. tapes and make announcements that way. And a really interesting way of doing marketing. Had to be crazy expensive. But Well, and having to use the technology of the time. I mean, obviously, VHS is the leader of it. And getting a tape in the mail, obviously, is not a cheap task to do. And sending it to all your subs, it's a lot to ask for. Yeah. In October 1994, Nintendo of America held an online promotional campaign through the internet service CompuServe. The campaign included downloadable video samples of the game, a trivia contest in which 800 people participated, and an hour-long online chat conference attended by 80 people in which Lincoln, President Minoru Akawa, and Vice President of Marketing Peter Main answered questions. Nintendo's CompuServe promotion marked an early instance of a major video game company using the internet to promote its products. Nintendo of America also partnered with Kellogg's for a promotional campaign in which the packaging for Kellogg's breakfast cereals featured Donkey Kong Country character art and announced a prize giveaway. The campaign ran from the game's release in November 1994 until April 1995. David DeRisnio, writing for Hardcore Gaming 101, described Nintendo's Donkey Kong Country promotion as marketing blitzkrieg. It was everywhere. You could not escape it. It was on the cover of every magazine. It was on gigantic, imposing displays and marquees at Walmart and Babbage's. For kids of the era, November 20th seemed like the eve of a revolution. The emphasis on Donkey Kong Country's SGI-rendered visuals built anticipation for the release. The exposed VHS tape also contributed significantly to the hype, and Nintendo would repeat the strategy with future releases such as Star Fox 64. Nintendo anticipated to sell approximately 2 million Donkey Kong Country units in one month. Main acknowledged that this was an unprecedented expectation, but said it's based on the -the off-the-chart reactions we received from game players and retailers. It's something that hasn't or has never been seen enough of in terms of breakthrough components that advances the state of gameplay, visuals, and audio. Marketing Blitzkrieg feels like every time that I watch Hulu and I see a Liberty Mutual commercial now, but it was a lot more (laughs) fun when it was Nintendo and video games and all kinds of other stuff everywhere. And obviously it worked out really well. Donkey Kong stuck around and we continued to see him in various Nintendo titles in all kinds of different villainous or non-villainous forms. Mm-hmm. And yeah, I mean, it, it just works. You pour money into the ads, people are going to see it. Exactly. And it worked. Yeah, it sold what it had to sold. But the most important part, it's not about the sales. It's about the gameplay. You can have a very hyped game and have poor gameplay, and that just means more people are going to go on the internet and complain about you. 
So Donkey Kong Country is a side-scrolling platform game in which the player must complete 40 levels to recover the Kong's banana horde, which has been stolen by the Crocodilian Kremlings. The game features both single-player and multiplayer game modes. In single-player, the player controls one of two characters, the gorilla Donkey Kong or his monkey nephew Diddy Kong. Switching between the two is necessary. Both characters offer different attributes. Donkey is stronger and can defeat enemies more easily, whilst Diddy moves faster and is more agile. Both playable Kongs can walk, run, jump, roll, pick up, and throw certain objects, while Donkey can pound the terrain to defeat enemies or find items. Multiplayer modes include the competitive contest mode or the cooperative team mode. In contest, each player controls their own set of Kongs but with different colors to differentiate between players and take turns playing each level as quickly as possible. The objective is to complete the most levels in the fastest time. In team mode, each player takes the role of one of the two Kongs and play as a tag team. The player navigates through the game via two game screens, the overworld map and a side-scrolling playfield which comprises the majority of the game. The overworld map displays an overhead representation of Donkey Kong Island and provides access to levels. Each level on the map is marked with an icon. Unfinished levels are marked by Kremlings, whilst completed areas are marked by Donkey or Diddy. The overworld also grants the player the opportunity to visit other members of the Kong family, including Funky Kong, which operates flight services, which allows the players to travel back and forth between different areas of the game. Jumping into Candy Kong's save barrels gives the players the chance to save their progress and encountering Cranky Kong in his cabins, which provide the player with tips and fourth wall breaking humor. The majority of the game takes place in linear levels, populated with various obstacles and enemies, which mostly involve the player traversing the stages by running, jumping, or defeating enemies by jumping on their heads or rolling into them. If the player is hit by an enemy, the leading Kong runs off screen, automatically enabling the player to take control of the other. They will only be able to control that Kong unless they free the other Kong from a barrel. The player is given a number of lives, which are lost if both Donkey and Diddy come into contact with an enemy or fall into bottomless pits. The game ends when the player runs out of lives, although they may continue their game from the most recent save point. Some levels feature unique mechanics, such as riding in minecarts, launching out of barrel cannons, or swinging from vine to vine. Each level features various items for the player to collect. These include bananas, gold letters that spell out K-O-N-G or Kong, extra life balloons, and the golden animal tokens that lead to bonus stages. Collecting 100 bananas, or all four Kong letters, will give the player an extra life, respectively. There are also secret paths that lead to bonus games, where the player can earn additional lives or other items, as well as gain possible shortcuts through the level. Each section of the map has one boss at the end, which must be defeated to advance through different parts of the overworld. In certain levels, the player can gain assistance from the Kong's five animal buddies found by breaking open unique crates. Animals provide boons, such as extra speed or jump height. Each animal can be found in an appropriately themed level. For example, On Guard, a swordfish that can defeat enemies with its bill, can only be found underwater, while Squawks, a parrot that carries a lantern, is found in one cave level. Other animal buddies include Rambi, a powerful rhinoceros that can charge into enemies and break open secret doors, Expresso, an ostrich which enables the Kongs to jump high and glide through the air, and Winky, a frog that can leap higher than any animal. The player can use each animal for the entirety of a level unless it is hit by an enemy. Did you have a favorite sidekick enemy? Rambi. Uh, not enemy. Uh, yeah. Partner. Animal. Yeah. I mean, on guard. It's, it's, a, it's, it's got the best mm. pun name for me for the swordfish. Like, yeah. fantastic with it. Uh, I like Rambi. It's a classic. It's a fun little ride. Jumping yeah. on Rambi. Yeah, it's probably Rambi for me, too. Just because mm-hmm. you can get him so early on, and all of a sudden, it's just like you start barreling through all these bad guys that you were sort of struggling with, maybe or yep. maybe not. Um, yeah, Rambi for sure. So, 
Obviously, as we've said, Donkey Kong Country is a reboot of the Donkey Kong franchise, but it's set long after the events of Donkey Kong and Donkey Kong Jr., which came out a year apart in 81 and 82. The original Donkey Kong grows old, moves to Donkey Kong Island, and takes on the moniker Cranky Kong, passing the Donkey Kong mantle down to his grandson. One night, the Kremlings, led by King K. Rule, invade Donkey Kong Island and steal the Kong's horde of bananas. Donkey, alongside his nephew Diddy, sets out on a journey to reclaim the banana horde and defeat the Kremlings. The two Kongs travel throughout Donkey Kong Island, battling the Kremlings and their henchmen, before reaching K. Rule's pirate ship, the Gangplank Galleon. The two take on K. Rule and seemingly defeat him, initiating a mock credits roll claiming that the Kremlings developed the game, but K. Rule gets back up to continue the fight. However, the Kongs persevere, defeat K. Rule, and reclaim the Banana Horde. And live happily ever after. Rare was so into that, like, satirical, cheeky humor thing. I mean, Banjo-Kazooie had a ton of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Conker's Conker's Bad Bad Fur Day, (laughs) obviously. You know, they were all about this, like, uh, subversive humor. Like, yeah, you're done with this game. Here's the credits. Oh, wait, no, you're not. Suck Mm -hmm. it. I invite you to suck it. That was basically (laughs) their mentality. It's done so well. And, and like, again, the the tongue-in-cheek, the very dry British humor for Cranky Kong, like, all of it just worked so well to encompass all this. And in my opinion, like, the story is interesting for you know an older game to have like a little bit of a story characters are great but the real tie-up and i mentioned this you know as one of the my favorite things within this is the music and sound design of donkey kong country and the future titles and david wise who's a fantastic composer composed most of the soundtrack wise started composing as a freelance musician He originally assumed his music would be replaced with compositions by Koji Kondo, the Super Mario composer, because he understood the importance of the Donkey Kong license to Nintendo, which is very fair. It's like, hey, I'm doing stand-in content for now. Koji Kondo's, or Koji Kondo, excuse me, is going to be coming along and just take my stuff out and make something much better. Yeah. But Rare asked Wise to record three jungle demo themes that were merged to become the DK Island Swing, the first level's track. Wise said, quote, I guess someone thought the music was suitable, as they offered me a full-time position at Rare. Rare allocated 32 kilobits to Wise. Prior to composing, Wise was shown the graphics and given an opportunity to play the level they would appear in, which gave him a sense of the music he would compose. Wise then chose samples and optimized the music to work on the SNES. Donkey Kong Country features atmospheric music that mixes natural environmental sounds with prominent melodic and percussive accompaniments. Its 1940s swing music style soundtrack attempts to evoke the environments and includes music from levels set in Africa-inspired jungles, caverns, oceanic reefs, frozen landscapes, and industrial factories. Wise cited Kondo's music for the Super Mario and Legend of Zelda games. Tim and Jeff Fallon's music for Plonk in 1993 Synthesizer film soundtracks released in the 1980s, 1990s rock and dance music, and his experience with brass instruments as all major influences. Wise wanted to imitate the sound of the Korg Wave Station synthesizer. He originally had all these wild visions of being able to sample pretty much everything, but could not due to memory restrictions. Wise worked separately from the rest of the team in a former cattle shed, visited occasionally by Tim Stamper. And so, of course, he's in a former cattle shed, and he's not in a studio because audio engineers like to be in weird places all the time for no reason. But really, they were probably just making do with what they had. Since Donkey Kong Country featured advanced pre-rendered graphics, Wise wanted to push the limits in terms of audio to create equally impressive music and make the most of the small space he was working with. He wanted the audio to stand out from other SNES games, like the visuals. Aquatic ambience, the music that plays in the underwater levels, took five weeks to create and was the result of Wise's efforts to create a, quote, waveform sequence on the SNES using his wave station. 
Wise composed Aquatic Ambience after he realized he could use the Wave Station and considers the track his favorite in the game and its biggest technological accomplishment in regards to the audio. The minimalist Cave Dweller Concert, which features only a marimba, drums, and synths, was influenced by Stamper, who wanted the track to be abstract and reflect the feeling of uncertainty associated with exploring dark caves. Stamper was also the driving force behind incorporating sound effects in the music, as he wanted them to play in levels but was limited by the SNES hardware. The DK Island Swing was inspired by jungle and tropical theme music Wise had been listening to, while K. Rule's theme was heavily influenced by the work of Iron Maiden. The title screen theme, added towards the end of development, is a remix of Nintendo's original Donkey Kong theme and was written to demonstrate how Donkey Kong had evolved since his debut. Composing Donkey Kong Country helped Wise establish his musical style. Wise noted that, when he composed video game music in the 1980s, he was limited by the NES's technological restrictions. When he heard Nintendo's composers create music around them, it encouraged him to go back and refine. Such restrictions helped him understand the importance of a console's sound channels and change his composition methods based on it, which played a role on Donkey Kong Country. Wise faced numerous challenges due to the technological restraints of the SNES, such as being unable to directly use a keyboard. And as such, Wise composed a rough track using the keyboard before transcribing the track in hexadecimal to input in MIDI. Wise had to keep music consistent across the SNES's eight sound channels, noting that if there was two minutes of music on one of these channels, there had to be exactly two minutes on the other seven channels. Wise noted this was a challenging, time-consuming process. However, it was easier than composing for the NES due to the larger number of sound channels. And Wise noted that it likely would have been impossible to create the soundtrack if Rare was developing on the Sega Mega Drive, which had an inferior FM sound chip. Additionally, Evelyn Fisher contributed seven tracks. Fisher was less experienced than Wise, who helped teach her as they worked together. She attempted, quote, to give a feeling of the place you were in and a sense of the momentum you needed through her compositions, which she felt were more atmospheric than Wise's. Funky Kong's theme had originally been written by Robin Beanlin for an internal progress video about another rare game, Killer Instinct. Nintendo decided to use the track in a Donkey Kong Country promotional trailer. Tim Stamper liked the track and wanted to include it in the game itself, so Wise adopted it. Meanwhile, character voice clips were provided by various rare employees. The chomping noises made by the claptrap enemy came from an artist who continually snapped his teeth as he worked. While Mark Betteridge provided the playable Kong's voice clips and Sutherland voiced the Kremlings. Sutherland with the classic, ah, that's, <laughs> that's some top talent right there. Yeah. That's, that was uh, well worth it, sir. Well worth it. Well worth it. During visits to the Twycross Zoo, Wise attempted to record real animal noises for inclusion, but again, as with the movements they provided, they were too quiet to be captured by his microphone. You couldn't just stick a boom over a gorilla or over these other animals to make stuff happen. And it there it is. Work. There it is. We were waiting for it. <laughs> weird audio engineers doing weird things. Mm-hmm. A promotional soundtrack CD, DK Jams, with a Z, it's the 90s, you have to have it, was released via news media and retailers in November 1994 with a standalone release in 1995. It was one of the earliest video game soundtrack albums released in the United States. Fun facts for you. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. And this soundtrack is really great. Uh, And I think more expansive than a lot of the Mm -hmm. other obviously there are classic melodies that have come from all these nintendo uh video games but i think that for the most part for a really long time they were just melodies and that was because they were dealing with all those technological restraints and things like that and this one i feel like is one of the first to just really be able to expand into like a more colorful soundtrack And it's another iconic one that comes out of here and inspired by Koji Kondo, but not done by him. And I think that that's, you know, really important to note that this was a person that was able to basically 
make a soundtrack at a level as Koji Kondo, who's one of the greatest video game composers of all time. Absolutely. So Nintendo published Donkey Kong Country for the SNES in November 1994. The UK release came first on November 18th, followed by a North American release on November 21st. The European release on November 21st, and the Japanese release was on November 26th. In Japan, the game was released under the title Super Donkey Kong, because you had Super, right? Everything's better. better. According to Rare, the game was released two weeks ahead of schedule, and Donkey Kong Country was released around the same time as Sega's Sonic and Knuckles for the SNES's chief competitor, the Sega Mega Drive. The Los Angeles Times called the coinciding releases a battle, as both advertise revolutionary technological advances like lock-on technology for Sonic and Knuckles and 3D rendered graphics for Donkey Kong Country. There were also re-released versions. An alternate, competition-oriented version of Donkey Kong Country was sold through Blockbuster. Its changes include a time limit for the playable levels and a scoring system, which had been used in the Nintendo Power Fest of 94 and Blockbuster World Video Game Championships 2 competitions. It was later distributed in limited quantities through Nintendo Power. And the competition version of Donkey Kong Country is the rarest licensed SNES game with only 2,500 cartridges known to exist. So for all you SNES collectors out there, baby, (laughs) this is the one. And if you got it, send it to us in the Discord, please. Send it to me in the mail, actually. Send it to me in the mail. (laughs) Well, yeah, do that, too. I don't have an SNES, actually. Don't do that. It'd be a waste. Yeah. Send it to Derek, a picture. Send it to me, the real thing. Thank you very much. <laughs> in 2000, Rare developed a port of Donkey Kong Country for Nintendo's Game Boy Color handheld console. And the port was developed alongside the GBC version of Perfect Dark, and many assets, including graphics and audio, were reused from Rare's Game Boy Donkey Kong games, like Donkey Kong Land, Derek's first Game Boy Pocket game. There you go. Uh, Aside from graphical and sound-related downgrades due to the GBC's weaker 8-bit hardware, the port is mostly identical to the original release. One level was redesigned while another was added, and it also adds bonus modes including two minigames that supplement the main quest and support multiplayer via the Game Link cable, as well as Game Boy printer support. Greg Mills was not involved with the port, but was impressed that it was possible to recreate the entire game on the Game Boy Color. Although Rare was acquired by Nintendo competitor Microsoft in 2002, dang, it seems so much more recent that happened. It does. That's wild. The studio continued to produce games for Nintendo's Game Boy Advance since Microsoft did not have a competing handheld. As such, it developed a version of Donkey Kong Country for the GBA, released in the West in June 2003, and in Japan the following December as part of Nintendo's line of SNES re-releases for the GBA. Is this one of the only games that is getting put out in the West before Japan? I feel like it is. I think, especially for Nintendo stuff, I believe so. And I think it's because you have Rare, who is this European dev, specifically a British dev, that is getting it to, obviously, around England in that time first, NA after... And then usually follows by, and I think Japan competes depending on like, because Mario obviously being a Japanese made game releases there. And so I think it's home country and then it goes whatever world it sweeps in. Yeah. You prioritize where you're from, right? Exactly. You have to go and do all the localization stuff. Yeah. It makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. According to Tim Stamper, the GBA Donkey Kong Country was developed from scratch using SNES emulators to rip the artwork because the original materials were stored on floppy disks with outdated file formats. The GBA version adds a new animated introductory cutscene, redesigned user interfaces and world maps, the ability to save progress anywhere, mini games, and a time trial mode. However, it features downgraded graphics and sound, the former due to the GBA's lack of a backlit screen. The SNES version of Donkey Kong Country has been digitally re-released for later Nintendo consoles via the Virtual Console service. It was released for the Wii Virtual Console in Japan and Europe in December 2006 and in North America in February 2007. In September 2012, the game was delisted from the Virtual Console catalog. 
The exact reason is unknown. Though the king himself, Kotaku's Jason Schreier, noted that it may have been related to licensing issues with Rare. Donkey Kong Country returned to the Wii U's virtual console in February 2015 and was added to the new Nintendo 3DS virtual console in March 2016. It was also included in the Super NES Classic Edition, a dedicated console Nintendo released in September 2017, and finally, released on the Nintendo Switch for Nintendo Switch Online subscribers in July 2020. So many, many opportunities to play this classic game and mm-hmm. see them sweet, sweet 90s graphics. We highly recommend doing it at some point just to really, I don't know, get a feel for some of the SNES stuff. And I actually really like the SNES Classic Edition. I think it's a great console. I think it's better than the NES Classic, and I have both. Yeah. And I, I would have to agree with that. I mean, you do get the limited palette of games, unfortunately. I know a lot of people unlocked it to put you know, ROMs and emulators and stuff onto it. But yeah. for what they do provide you, it is a really good list of games that going back to them talking about the artwork, Donkey Kong Country and its, you know, future successors, they still look good. It looks like an indie game that's developed today. Like something that you would use, like whatever art style you have available. It looks as if, if not better than a lot of those and still feels relevant. The controls still feel crisp. It still feels good to play. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. It's it's definitely a game that I think holds up very, very well. And I don't feel a lot of difference between playing the original Donkey Kong Country and those Wii and Wii U and Switch mm-hmm. remasters. Mm-hmm. I really don't. So Donkey Kong Country was critically acclaimed upon release in November 1994. At game rankings, the SNES version received an 89% and the Game Boy Color version, 90%, with the Game Boy Advance version at a 79. The Game Boy Advance port also holds a favorable 78 out of 100 on Metacritic. The game's novel use of pre-rendered 3D models and visuals were lauded among critics, with many citing that its graphics were the first of its kind and helped set it far apart from its contemporaries. Lucas Thomas from IGN and Scott Marriott from all game, both commended the game's advanced visual techniques and expressed surprise that Nintendo's 16-bit system could deliver such vitality. While GameSpot's Frank Provo felt that the Donkey Kong Country's graphical prowess rivaled that of the forthcoming 32-bit consoles. Although contemporary critics had praise for the game's fluid and fast-paced platforming, some retrospective reviewers have since taken a more critical stance and described its gameplay as overrated. Thomas felt that Donkey Kong Country's visuals sacrificed gameplay in favor of fast sales and a short-run attention grab, which did not live up to the standards of some of Shigeru Miyamoto's more polished gameplay designs. Wise's atmospheric soundtrack attracted universal acclaim. Nadia Oxford from US Gamer considered the game's soundtrack lends favorably to its oppressive vibe and commended Wise's debut to the series, while Marriott felt his rendition offered some of the richest sounds on the SNES. Michel Garnier from J-Video gave particular praise to the soundtrack's diversity, lauding the rhythmic oscillation between levels and distinctive sound effects, in which some add perfectly to the game's darker environments. Writing for Entertainment Weekly, Bob Strauss complimented the CD-quality music, while Alexei Kapalny from Top Secret thought that Wise's captivating soundtrack asserted itself as a masterpiece in its own right. Jeff Pearson of Nintendojo praised each level's unique musical theme and considered each of them an accurate reflection of their respective environments, while remarking that it pushes the SNES's audio chip to the limit along with its graphical prowess. Donkey Kong Country won numerous Game of the Year accolades. It was awarded GamePro's Best Graphic Achievement Award at the 1994 Consumer Electronics Show and won several awards from Electronic Gaming Monthly, including Best SNES Game, Best Animation, Best Game Duo, and Game of the Year in their 1994 Video Game Awards. It also received a Nintendo Power Award for Best Overall Game of 1994 and two Kids' Choice Awards in 94 and 95 for Favorite Video Game. It is the only video game listed in Time's top 10 best products of 1994. 
Now, the success of the game reestablished Donkey Kong series as a popular Nintendo franchise. Rare's redesign of the Donkey Kong character has been used in all future Nintendo games featuring him, including his appearances in the Super Smash Bros. series and various Mario spin-off titles, such as, you know, like the Mario parties and anything else that he's just included as like a side character or even a playable character. Donkey Kong Country spawned two sequels for the SNES. Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy's Conquest, was released in 1995 to critical and commercial success, and Donkey Kong Country 3, Dixie Kong's Double Trouble, debuted in 96 as the SNES's lifespan came to a close. In addition to starring in Donkey Kong Country 2, Diddy Kong featured its own spin-off, Diddy Kong Racing, another top, top game, that was released for the Nintendo 64. Diddy Kong Racing received critical acclaim and became one of the console's best-selling games. Diddy also joined Donkey Kong as a Super Smash Bros. character in Super Smash Bros. Brawl in 2008, while King K. Rule debuted as a Smash character in Super Smash Bros. Ultimate in 2018. Donkey Kong Country's success helped solidify Rare as one of the video game industry's leading developers. Rare's relationship with Nintendo continued, into the following generation and resulted in numerous critically and commercially successful games for the Nintendo 64, such as GoldenEye 007 and Banjo-Kazooie. Rare also continued to support the Donkey Kong franchise with games such as the Donkey Kong Land Trilogy, which condensed Donkey Kong Country's platforming for the handheld Game Boy, and Donkey Kong 64. After Microsoft acquired Rare in 2001, the rights to the franchise reverted to Nintendo. Retro Studios revived the Donkey Kong Country series in 2010 with Donkey Kong Country Returns for the Wii, followed by Donkey Kong Country Tropical Freeze for the Wii U and the Switch. Both games were critically and commercially successes. Naughty Dog founders Andy Gavin and Jason Rubin cited Donkey Kong Country as the primary influence on the gameplay of their company's breakout title, Crash Bandicoot. Gavin elaborated that the game's first successfully designed level drew upon basic techniques employed by Donkey Kong Country, such as steam vents, drop platforms, bouncy pads, heated pipes, and enemy characters that move back and forth. Real quick, Mario Kart 64, Diddy Kong Racing. See, that's a tough one. They're both godsends, and they both have their own place. Mario Kart 64 is more of a party game for me, Diddy Kong Racing is more of a champion who is the best of the best game. That's how I feel about either of those. That was such a non-answer. The answer was Diddy Kong Racing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. You are the weakest Listen, One link. lived on and one died out. That's true. That's fair. Both contemporary and retrospective critics cohesively asserted that Donkey Kong Country's visual appeal helped increase the lifespan of Nintendo's then-fledgling SNES and helped Nintendo save face in a period of uncertainty for cartridge-based games. And I feel like they still face that every single time they do something. Every time mm -hmm. it's like, oh, this game, this is what saved Nintendo. I yep. don't know if I buy into it anymore. But Matthew Castle from the official Nintendo magazine noted that the game brought next-generation graphics to the console just 12 days before the rival PlayStation's Japanese launch, proving to consumers that an immediate upgrade was unnecessary. Lucas Thomas from IGN wrote that the game had saved the SNES and helped revitalize sales by bringing back many lapsed fans. Conversely, Eurogamer's Tom Bramwell felt that many fans gave undue attention to Donkey Kong Country's lifespan and remarked that it became fashionable to dislike its graphics. Parrish described Donkey Kong Country as Nintendo's bluff to make the SNES seem as if it could compare to the superior hardware that the PlayStation and Saturn offered. Its visual fidelity obscured what Parrish felt was the fact that it was inferior gameplay-wise to SNES launch titles like Super Mario World. A great game, I will concede. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has been included in lists compiling the most overrated games of all time. Electronic Gaming Monthly's staff summarized it and its sequels as games that got more respect than they truly deserved. However, the game has also appeared on many lists ranking the greatest video games of all time. 
In the years following the game's release, rumors spread that Miyamoto disliked Donkey Kong Country and found it amateurish, provoking him to create the hand-drawn art style of Yoshi's Island. He was allegedly quoted as telling Electronic Games Magazine in 1995 that Donkey Kong Country proves that players will put up with mediocre gameplay as long as the art is good. However, in 2010, Miyamoto denied these rumors, saying, I was very involved in the game, and even emailing almost daily with Tim Stamper right up until the end. In 2019, video game historian Frank Cifaldi checked the Electronic Games issue with the Miyamoto interview and found it contained no such quote. And so Look we have all bones. those internet rumors, the rumor mill spreading all this fake Donkey Kong information. <laughs> <laughs> it's what you really have to look out for, Derek. Fake I've never gone so deep into the internet that I found the Donkey Kong rumor mill message boards, <laughs> but I imagine that they're a fun read. They but have yeah. to be if, if if you go that far with it. But it's it is it really is interesting. Just that it feels like there's always the the one game that saves Nintendo from graphical uh, deficiencies compared to its competitors. Mm-hmm. And they're still around, and they've been doing it for a long time, and they've been influencing video gaming for a very long time, and they do it in their own way, but it's kind of crazy just to have a retrospective and see you know, people loving it, and then doing the retrospective and being like, but why did they love it? To me, yeah, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip ahead a little bit here. Why did we choose to cover this game? What do I think of it? I think that it's a great game. And I don't think that you can have this game um, and say it's bad and then also be a fan of Sonic, Crash Bandicoot, Super Mario Brothers. I think it's in that same van, same vein, my God. I think it's in that same vein. Put them all in a van, (laughs) have them hang out together, and they're all the same guy. (laughs) <laughs> I mean, really, like Donkey Kong focuses so much more on the speedy gameplay. And I feel like Sonic and Donkey Kong are very, very similar games in a lot of regards. It's it, It'll always get compared to, you know, other side scrollers and it'll always get compared to uh, Super Mario Brothers because it is a Nintendo title. But sure. it was different enough to where I feel like the attacking aspects, for example, set it apart a little bit more. Obviously, the banana collecting aspect is the same as the coins. It's the same as the rings. Sure. Mm-hmm. Whatever Crash Bandicoot collects. Um, uh, yeah. Wampa Fruit. Wampa Fruit. That's right. I don't know why that was on the tip of my brain, but it was right there as soon as you said it. Couldn't think of it, but I'm glad you remembered Wampa Fruit. Um, I just feel like, yeah, there were a lot of these games in that era that all performed very similarly, looked really great. And Mm -hmm. obviously by this point, we're not talking so much about Super Mario Brothers, but their sequels and the SNES stuff like Super Mario World. Um, but I feel like it, it fits right along in that same vein to, to say that those games are somehow great and that Donkey Kong is somehow terrible. I don't really agree with. So I give this game a seven out of 10. I was a little bit worse at this game than I was at Super Mario Brothers because of the more fast-paced style, but I did enjoy it more than I liked Sonic the Hedgehog at the time. All really great games, slightly different. I feel like all really iconic and worth playing to at least sort of see where you fit in speed-wise in the side-scrolling realm. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, incorrect review, but... Uh, you know, if we were to talk about uh, Diddy Kong Racing, you know, my friend, I don't care. Of course, that's that's ten out of ten. I'll give that a number all day long. Um, but if if we had to, you know, talk and break this down, the the visuals are a standpoint. Like I know that people want to like, be like, oh, that takes away from the gameplay, and that's a lot of the retrospective reviewers are like it's not that good. Their visuals aren't that good. They are. They hold up. They stand up, and it looks fantastic. The movements, enemies, even just like enemies dying. Whether it's like the bees or any of like even Diddy or Donkey Kong like dying off or any of the Kremlings, like it's done so well and it feels so fluid. And there are frustrating times, like you said, like if you're going fast paced, you want to slow down a little bit. Sometimes you jump off a cliff and try to recover, you just can't. 
Um, but there's just so many cool aspects that even lead into the future Donkey Kongs. Like I said, the spider with just the dripped out shoes, like that's oh such a great character to have in the later Donkey Kongs. Yeah, spider with and, the J's. Yeah, man. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So it's it's they add to it, and each game feels a little bit visually updated in a way, but even if they didn't have to do any of that, like the visuals are so good. And like you said, like all the future Donkey Kongs have pretty much just improved upon what this is. Not really changing the formula too much, just improving upon what this first one has done. And it's one of the best, in my opinion, redesigned characters. Like you take a character that's like really no backstory besides the arcade machines and is just like, this ape, this, you know, pixely gorilla ape that is just tossing these barrels down, has no other real context to it. Um, even with Donkey Kong, or yeah, Donkey Kong Jr., same type of idea, but bringing this to a screen, redesigning the character, taking some elements that you've known from these past games you've created, and adding it to it has done so, so well. So if I had to rate this game, I would give it a oh out of, <laughs> that's, what, that's Donkey Kong getting hit. Um, I mean, Diddy Kong, excuse me. But that's sorry. That's Alex, really close. This is a to clean it. podcast, so you can't. You can't. <laughs> I, no, say that, that was like from that. the soundboard I have. Oh. That was from the soundboard I, <laughs> I, I have. You can't and use then, your soundboard on this um, podcast anymore. I would have to give it also out of a. That's when you die. That's the sad sound. Um, that's part of it, as well as beep boop beep beep boop beep boop. Boop. That's the overworld tune mm. when you're like waiting to like pick something. Goes, yeah. bam, 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 um, out of ten. Wow, that was good. Uh, okay. Your soundboard is amazing, and it sounds just like it was. You. It was great. It was great. I just got it. It's it's fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Research for this episode was done by Alex Kendall and Derek Baker. The intro and outro music for this episode was written and recorded by our friend Evan Barr, and our beautiful new artwork was designed and given to us by Aaron Shattuck. And I want to thank all those who are on our Patreon who actually voted for this episode. So if you want to be a part of that, you can join our Patreon today, as well as jump into some bonus episodes, extra content, or D&D Playground. D&D Playground? Just join our D and D. I I can't think of words with our D and D. But join our D and D. Those are Minecraft server and various other perks that you can get. And we want to thank some select members today: with Sky the Bear, Grant Dillon, Mister Choff, Nick Hyman, McChief, Climbing Spork, Mister eighteen ninety eight, and Lee Tom John. So thank you all for the support. We truly appreciate it. You can follow us on Instagram, Twitter. We're also on Discord. Alex and I are hanging out in there all the time. It's free to join, and we'd love to see you. And as always, you can check us out on Twitch. You can check me out at twitch.tv slash sourman70. That's S-O-U-R-M-A-N-7-0. Or Derek over at twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. That is twitch.tv slash thebakerman247. This podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or most likely your favorite podcast listening platform. If you haven't yet, leave us a review. It helps us out a lot, and we love to hear from you. And that has been our coverage of Donkey Kong Country. Have you guys grown up or played this on some of your new titles? What do you think of Donkey Kong as just a beautiful character? Just that, mm, that tie? As well as a series as a whole. Like, Do you want to see a new title come out that adds to it? Or should we go back to that Donkey Kong Bongos game that was Donkey Konga, baby. Donkey Konga. (laughs) As always, I am your host, Alex Kendall. And I am your host, Johnny Blastoff. And this has been Finish the Fight, a gaming podcast. (laughs) 